For a while now, some Christians have been saying that Jesus of Nazareth wasn't really raised from the dead. But it's time to call a halt to this idea and look again at the evidence. Christians need to understand that the stories of Jesus' bodily resurrection are true. It really happened, and if it didn't, there's not much point being a Christian. Christian faith is based on the dramatic but seemingly impossible proposition that Jesus of Nazareth rose from the dead. Christianity got going in the first place because the early Christians believed that he had been raised bodily, leaving an empty tomb behind him and thereby launching God's whole new world. I think the early Christians were right. I'm not saying that just because I'm a bishop or even because I'm a Christian. In fact, one of the reasons I am a Christian is because as a historian of the ancient world, I've looked closely at the evidence for Christian origins and it stands up pretty well. The question is, do you have the courage to follow the argument and see where it leads? Dare you agree with me? The stormy question of Jesus' resurrection takes us back to events which happened here in Jerusalem nearly 2,000 years ago. We're not making a leap of blind faith. This is a historical inquiry into the extraordinary happenings of the first Easter. We can still visit the places where it all happened. This is real on the ground first century history. For many people, not least Christians like myself, the story of Jesus has become so familiar, so covered over with hindsight, that we easily forget that he was a real human being who lived within real history. He lived at a particular time when the Roman Empire was at its height and at a particular place here in the Middle East. And if we're gonna understand his story, not least the story of his resurrection, it's important to grasp how people in that world thought and what they believed and within that, how Jesus himself thought and what he believed. Jesus was, of course, Jewish, and so were all his followers. Whatever they said about his rising from the dead, whether they were making it up or not, we need to know what they meant. We need to know what Jewish beliefs were about life after death. And those beliefs had a very long history. This is the western wall of the great Jewish temple which dominated Jerusalem in Jesus' time. Today, the wall is still venerated by devout Jews, even though the temple is gone. But the Jewish religion then was rather different from what it is now. It's true that the Jews were the only people in the ancient world who believed in one single creator God, in the Roman world, that made them very odd indeed. But in other respects, their religion was quite conventional. Their priests up there in the temple made offerings and public sacrifices, pretty much like the pagan priests of classical Athens. And like all religions, Judaism had its own understanding about death and about what happens to people after they have died. The Hebrew word for hell was Gehenna, the name of this valley. In Jesus' day, this was where the locals came to dump their rubbish. The whole place stank because of all the garbage rotting in the Mediterranean sun, smoldering and flickering into flame. This image inspired some later ideas of hell. The ancient Israelites saw death as a one-way trip to a gloomy world which they called Sheol. It was final. Nobody came back from there. 
The living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. Their love and their hatred and their envy have already perished. Never again will they have any share in all that happens under the sun. This was the orthodoxy of ancient Israel. But by Jesus' day, things had changed quite a lot. Judaism by then had come under many different influences, not least the world of the ancient Greeks. So what did the ancient Greeks think about life after death? Could the idea of resurrection have come from there? The original source of all the stories about Jesus' resurrection is the New Testament. Here in the Gospels and also in the letters of St. Paul, we have the core writings of the Christian faith. Most of them were written less than 40 years after Jesus died. And they were written not in Hebrew or Aramaic, but Greek to reach the widest readership. At the time, the Jews were only a small and insignificant part of the Roman Empire and over most of the empire, the dominant civilization was still Greek. In Jesus' time, non-Jewish people all over the Mediterranean world regarded this as the landscape of the afterlife, and they had done so for centuries. To them, the river Acheron was the frontier between the living and the dead. It was here that Charon, the deathly boatman, was believed to ferry the shades of the departed to Hades, the land of the dead. It's all described with uncanny accuracy in their literature, right down to the arrangement of the rivers, the mountains, and the sea. For the ancient Greeks, the equivalent of the Old Testament was the poetry of Homer, the Iliad, and the Odyssey. And in those books, there are one or two wonderful passages which describe what it's like being dead. To be honest, it's not a nice thing being dead in the world of Homer. You don't have a body, you don't have a lovely, blissful heaven to look forward to. Instead, it's a dark and gloomy place where shadows flit to and fro, things that used to be human but really aren't anymore. The one thing they don't have is bodies. There's one spectacular passage where Odysseus goes down to Hades and he meets, among other people, the shade of his own mother. And he tries to embrace her, but he can't because she's only just a shadow flitting to and fro and she then explains to him why that is. All people are like this when they are dead. The sinews no longer hold the flesh and bones together. These perish in the fierceness of consuming fire as soon as life has left the body and the soul flits away as though it were a dream. The poem tells us that the meeting took place right here in the valley of the Acheron. So it's no surprise that people began to come here in the hope of contacting the dead and seeing into the future. So this ruin is called the Necromantion, or death magic place. It's an oracle dedicated to Persephone, goddess of the dead. In ancient times, worshippers would visit the shrine and after a period of prayer and sacrifice, they would be conducted through the labyrinth and down into the underworld. There in the darkness, they would consult the priestess on the frontier between the living and the dead, just as today one might visit a medium. but it was only ever about a meeting with spirits. So here we are at the end of the tunnel, and what do we find? Quite literally, 
a dead end, illustrating quite graphically the truth that the ancient classical world knew just as much as we do with the benefit of modern science. Once you're dead, you're dead. There's no way back. Of course, people would come here and try to get in touch with the dead, but the one thing that they couldn't do was then to take them back home with them afterwards. So for many people, the answer was a shrug of the shoulders. Known fui, fui. Known sum, known curo. You find it in Latin inscriptions all over the ancient world. I was not, I was. I am not, I don't care. That's it. And yet, there was often a wistful hope that maybe things weren't quite that certain. Ancient Athens was one of the most fertile intellectual seedbeds the world has ever known. What we call drama was invented here, and in this theatre, plays were produced which hint that there might be exceptions to the rule that the dead stayed in a world of ghosts. There were myths of godlike heroes, like Hercules, and people like the Roman Emperor Trajan, celebrated in this very inscription, were even thought to have become gods themselves. Perhaps the most influential Greek idea about the afterlife arose in Athens. About 400 years before Jesus' time, the Athenian philosopher Plato founded a school of philosophy in an olive grove called Akademi. And he came up with an idea which still feels very modern. Plato taught that the abstract was more real than the physical, and so a person's soul, their essence, their personality, was more real and permanent than their body. The body itself, said Plato, was a kind of prison. When someone died, their soul was freed from the body, let loose, as it were. So for Plato, death was the way you got out of prison, the prison house of this present body. After death, the righteous souls, which presumably means those who loved wisdom, would go off to a land of celestial bliss. They had different ways of unpacking this. Sometimes they talked about the islands of the blessed, the lovely distant country that people would end up in forever and ever. So there really was, for Plato, a life after death, and it was far better than anything this present world had to offer. It was a powerful idea, and it certainly took off. It was expounded in universities right across the ancient world. Here in Athens was the most important of them. It survived for centuries, until at last it was closed down by order of a Christian Roman emperor. It's perhaps ironic that it was a Christian emperor who finally shut down this academy here, because when I was growing up, most people in the Western Church assumed a view of life after death, which was actually very similar to the one that Plato and his followers would have taught. People went on using the word resurrection, but what they usually were referring to was not an actual bodily life through death and out the other side, but simply a view of a blissful hereafter, exactly the sort of thing that you'd have been taught down here. But in fact, there is a critical distinction between that kind of teaching and what all the early Christians believed. They really did believe that Jesus had been bodily raised from the dead and that one day God would do that for all of his people as well. That idea was, of course, outrageous to anybody in the classical world. So Jesus' followers were not drawing from Greek philosophy when they spoke of Jesus rising from the dead. And if the ancient Israelite faith wasn't the inspiration either, where then could the idea of resurrection have come from? It could have come from a new strain of Judaism. A radicalizing of the ancient faith was afoot in Israel at the time of Jesus. The rule book of what happens after death was being ripped up. In about AD 30, rumors began to spread in Jerusalem. They concerned a religious firebrand called Jesus of Nazareth. He had come to Jerusalem 
to challenge the establishment with a revolutionary message, and he had duly been executed. But now his followers were saying that he had been raised from the dead. Why would they say that? After all, as we've seen, it flies in the face of all the received wisdom of the ancient world. Everybody knew that people couldn't and didn't get themselves raised from the dead. But that's what they said. And we're going to find out why. Jews in ancient Israel had believed that death was a one-way trip into a sunless world from which no one ever returned. And in Jesus' time, some Jews still believed that. According to the chief priests up there in Jerusalem, that was what was in store for everybody after death, the traditional gloomy Mediterranean underworld. But in the two centuries or so before the time of Jesus, some Jewish thinkers began to develop quite a different picture of what happens to people after they die. These new ideas didn't emerge from mere intellectual speculation. They arose because of sharp political oppression. By the time of Jesus, it had been many years since the Jews had lived in real independence. The Jewish people had been assaulted and conquered by invaders from all sides, most recently by the Roman Empire. But they never lost hope for the future, and this place was one of the focal points for that hope. This is the settlement of Qumran. It was the home of a small group of Jews called the Essenes. In many ways, it resembles a monastery with its communal facilities. But what makes this place special for us is that it gives us a sudden glimpse into the way some Jews of Jesus' time were thinking. The people who settled here were longing for the biblical promises to come true, for independence and justice and peace, and for the coming king, the Messiah, who would bring it all about. They wrote about the coming great battle, a vast cataclysm, which would overthrow the wicked pagans and change forever the way the world was run. At this point in our language, religion and politics are basically the same thing, a hope for this world with God in the middle of it. We know this because in the caves in the mountains close by were found what are called the Dead Sea Scrolls, hundreds of manuscripts, some complete, some in fragments, but all sharing an apocalyptic hope for the future. The Lord is holy, and the King of glory is with us. Collect your spoil. Place your hand on the neck of your enemies and your foot on the piles of slain. Their king shall wait on you. All your oppressors lie prone before you. They shall lick the dust off your feet. This hope transformed Jewish ideas about what happens after death. People started to believe that when God's kingdom arrived, the dead would be brought back into a new bodily life. This is where the whole idea of resurrection really begins. It was a revolutionary idea, both theologically and politically. It was a seed that was going to bear enormous fruit. The classic text is in the book of Daniel. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. These ideas about the coming apocalypse had already taken hold when a young prophet appeared on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. He began to preach to the people of the little settlements surrounding the lake. His name was Jesus. No one expected to find the Messiah here or for him to sound like this. Makarioi hoi ptuchoi to pneumatei. 
Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you. In Jesus' day, Galilee was a ferment of different cultures, Jews and pagans living side by side, a history of missionary movements, popular miracle workers, all sorts. Jesus fits right into this context. But his message had a special note of urgency. God's new world was breaking into the present one, even as he spoke. The kingdom, he declared, was arriving here and now, and it was time for everyone to get on board. As Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Jesus went from town to town, curing the sick. Not far from here, according to the story, he fed 5,000 people with two loaves and a few fish. He taught the crowds that the time had come for God's kingdom to be established. But there are some things he didn't say very much about. Given what happened later, it's remarkable that in the gospel stories about Jesus, there's scarcely any mention of resurrection. The coming of God's kingdom, yes. God's lavish welcome for outcasts and sinners, yes. Warnings about what would happen if people didn't respond, yes. But rising from the dead, hardly at all. When he does mention it, he uses the language of the revolutionary new beliefs. And in that world, resurrection will only take place when the Holy Kingdom finally arrives. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Jesus was echoing the apocalyptic ideas of his day, which were becoming increasingly popular as Judaism became more inclined towards revolution, longing for God's new world and hoping to bring it to birth. This new Judaism was being expounded by a group of teachers who were beginning to be called rabbis in a new class of building known as synagogues. Jesus taught in synagogues too. Indeed, according to the Gospels, he preached right here in Capernaum, though the buildings we see here today are the result of a rebuild some while after his time. But what he and everybody listening to him was most concerned about was the coming of God's kingdom, and they knew that when that happened, all the dead would be raised. Jesus never said anything here in Capernaum about a special resurrection for himself. Two or three years of teaching in Galilee prepared the ground for Jesus to make his move. He believed it was time to go to Jerusalem and confront the people in power with the fact that God's kingdom was coming at last. In Galilee, he'd always been coy about whether or not he was the expected Messiah. But when he arrived in Jerusalem, he was much more explicit. The Gospels tell us that he arrived from the east riding on a donkey and was acclaimed by people waving palm branches in honor of the new king in Israel. Jesus was consciously acting out a biblical prophecy from the book of Zechariah about the way in which God's king, the new king of Israel, would arrive in Jerusalem riding on a donkey. He was deliberately behaving in such a way as to fit in with ideas people already had about the way God's kingdom would arrive, the way God's king would appear. When he arrived at the Mount of Olives, then as now he would have been confronted by rows of graves, assembled, waiting for resurrection at the end of time, just as most Jews by now believed. However, within just over a week, 
Jesus would be arrested and crucified. And soon after that, his followers were to develop an idea of resurrection which was completely new. They claimed that their leader had himself already been raised from the dead. In all their tradition, there was nothing that could have prepared for such a thing, not in the classical world, not in their own Jewish tradition, nor even, except for a few cryptic hints, in anything Jesus himself had said. It was, in fact, such an unlikely claim that they must have had extremely good reason for making it. Maybe it actually happened. When Jesus came into Jerusalem, it must have looked as though he was staging a triumph. But that wasn't how things worked out. Within a few days, he had caused uproar. He had challenged the temple authorities and implicitly threatened the rule of Rome. The people in power reacted. They planned to arrest him and kill him. Eventually, according to the Gospels, he gathered his closest associates together for a meal in an upstairs room. We now know that meal as the Last Supper. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Over a thousand years later, the Crusaders decided that this was the room where it all took place. As medieval Christians, they tended to see the event colored by what they knew took place next. And for them, they assumed that the disciples, like Jesus himself, had the resurrection in mind throughout the whole event. But there's nothing of that in the original stories. On the contrary, they sound more like Jesus saying goodbye to his followers. There's no mention of resurrection, there's not much about a hint of triumph even. All we have is a strange sense that somehow, maybe, God's kingdom was going to come at last. They thought they knew what that would mean, but they were wrong. That night, in a garden called Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives, one of Jesus' friends betrayed him to the authorities and he was arrested, tried, and condemned. The following day, he was taken out and forced to carry his cross down this very road. But in those days, it ran out of the city and towards the execution ground. And here, on that very spot, the Christians have built their great church of the Holy Sepulchre. This is where it all happened. Here are the actual locations where the crucial events in the Christian story took place. Pilgrims have been coming here for centuries. Upstairs in the chapel of Calvary or Golgotha, we find the place where the cross was set up. So when they got to this place, this very spot, they nailed Jesus to the cross through his wrists and his ankles. And they put the cross up here and strung him up with two brigands, revolutionaries, one on either side of him. At the time, it must have seemed as though it was total failure, the end of everything Jesus had hoped for and worked for. As he himself famously shouted out, my God, my God, why did you abandon me? So far, it's all uncontroversial. We have Roman and Jewish evidence as well that Jesus was indeed crucified. But what happened next was totally unexpected. All the Gospels tell us that after Jesus died, his body was removed for burial in a nearby tomb by some rich supporters. 
This is the kind of tomb where they would have buried Jesus. It's been carved out of the solid rock. The body would have been brought here and carried inside and laid out on a ledge. Then they would have rolled an enormous stone over the mouth of the cave and sealed it up. Jewish practice at the time was to anoint a corpse with spices, wrapping them up in the shroud or winding sheet. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Taking Jesus' body, they wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where he was laid. Here, in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, close by the place of crucifixion, are the remains of the tomb in which the body of Jesus is said to have been laid out by his friends. The surrounding rock from which the tomb was cut has all been removed and the shrine has been built on top. It's the geographical heart of the Christian faith. This place really isn't like a saint's tomb. It isn't venerated because Jesus is buried here, but because, so Christians believe, this is where he was raised from the dead. Now, that was incredible then. People in the ancient world weren't stupid after all. And it's incredible today, which is why many have come up with the theory that actually there wasn't a resurrection as such. It was just that the disciples had a very profound spiritual experience, which they talked about metaphorically in terms of resurrection. Some people have even tried to co-opt St. Paul into that theory, which, as he's our earliest Christian writer, could be quite significant. But it simply doesn't work. St. Paul himself and all other early Christians for whom we have any evidence really did believe that Jesus was raised bodily from the dead. The story begins on the Sunday after Jesus' crucifixion. Mary Magdalene and two other women came back to the tomb to anoint his body once more with spices. When they got there, they found that the stone had been rolled away and there was nothing but an empty tomb. Later, they were to say that they had seen someone there dressed in white who told them that Jesus had been raised from the dead. The gospel stories about finding Jesus' empty tomb are quite unlike the other stories we find in the New Testament. Elsewhere, we find that the stories of Jesus have had allusions to the Bible woven in or theological messages drawn out. But the empty tomb stories aren't like that. They read like plain, crude, unvarnished eyewitness testimony. There's no spin to them at all. All of the witnesses confirm the basic outline of the Easter story. The women visit the tomb and find it empty. And this is what makes it almost certain that it's true. <laughs> 
because in Jewish law at that time, women were regarded as such unreliable witnesses that they weren't even allowed to give evidence in court. No one hoping to convince an ancient audience would have invented a story in which the original witnesses were women. But by the time the Gospels came to be written, no one was able to alter it. It was too well known. All of this provides a strong argument that the stories haven't been made up much later, as people have often imagined. They refer to something which actually happened. But an empty tomb by itself doesn't mean resurrection. There are all sorts of reasons why the tomb might have been empty. Grave robbers, for example, or they might have gone to the wrong tomb. But all that changed with what happened next. The crucifixion had demoralized Jesus' followers. They couldn't understand what was going on. But tradition has it that on the same day that the women had discovered the empty tomb, their mood changed. This garden is said to be where that change began. That very day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, as they were discussing and arguing with each other. Jesus himself approached and walked with them. Their eyes, though, were prevented from recognizing him. When they arrived in Emmaus, there were even stranger events. The disciples sat down for a meal with the resurrected Jesus. And as he was sitting at table with them, he took the bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to them. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. Here in this lovely garden, it's hard for us to realize just how shocking this story must have been, even for Jews who already believed in the resurrection. The disciples were saying that they'd not only seen Jesus, but that they'd begun to share a meal with him. This wasn't the mass resurrection that Jews of the time were expecting when the kingdom of God came. This was the resurrection of one person within the middle of history, someone who could hold a conversation with you and go for a walk with you, and who would leave footprints behind him in the sand, and even broken bread on a table. And yet, in spite of all this, there was something very strange about him. Jesus seems able to appear and disappear at will. Clearly, this isn't simply a resuscitation back into the same sort of body he had before. Jesus seems to have gone through death and out the other side into a new, transformed kind of body. And curiously, all the gospel accounts of the risen Jesus seem to share this same peculiarity. This strangeness leads us close to the heart of the mystery not only as to whether Jesus' own resurrection actually took place, but also as to why these events set in motion what we now know as Christianity. On the first Easter Sunday, some of Jesus' followers had discovered an empty tomb. Others even said that they had seen Jesus himself and even had a meal with him. But few people believed them. After all, everyone knew such things were impossible. They knew the stories of heroes like Hercules or the Jewish prophet Elijah who had been taken up to heaven. And in the ancient world, just as today, people were familiar with the idea that the recently dead might appear to them. They expected to meet their relatives in dreams and in waking visions too. <laughs> 
but this was quite different. According to the early Christians, the appearances of Jesus weren't just visions. They were more solid, more bodily than that. And it was these appearances, combined with the fact of the empty tomb, that convinced them that he really had been raised from the dead. The most dramatic of these appearances is said to have happened right here in this room where the Last Supper had taken place. This, according to John's Gospel, was where the original doubting Thomas was finally convinced. Since the discovery of the empty tomb, Jesus had appeared to several of his followers, but Thomas hadn't yet seen him, and he needed proof. But a week after the incident at Emmaus, the disciples gathered again in their upstairs room. The doors were shut. Jesus came and stood in the middle of them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he addressed Thomas. Bring your finger here, he said, and inspect my hands. Bring your hand here and put it into my side. Don't be faithless, just believe. My master, replied Thomas, and my God. Is it because you've seen me that you believe, replied Jesus? God's blessing on people who don't see and yet believe. This story is just like all the other events, only the details are different, and they all come down to a physical experience. All the stories agree that Jesus was alive, not dead. They involve physical things like bread and fish and the scars of the crucifixion. And at the same time, there's something strange about Jesus. He can appear and disappear at will, for example. These experiences were unprecedented. They convinced Jesus' followers that he really was the Messiah after all. What's more, they forced them to rethink their traditional Jewish beliefs as to what resurrection itself was all about. Resurrection wasn't just something that would happen to everybody at the end of time. It had happened to Jesus himself already in advance. The question of how resurrection would happen and what precisely it would mean were reshaped and refocused. This radical rethinking of traditional Jewish belief could only have happened as a result of something that they had experienced, something that had really occurred, something they certainly had not been expecting. So when today you visit Jesus' empty tomb, preserved in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, you're visiting a place that is rooted in history, not fantasy. Of course, after centuries of Christian worship here, it has become a focus of religious experience. It can generate very powerful emotions. But it would be a huge mistake to imagine that the impact of feelings like that is what set Christianity in motion. Christianity didn't begin as a new religious experience. It began with the claim that something had happened, something which had changed the world, something that had happened to Jesus. And when we trace that claim, we find that it goes back to two things in particular. First, to the belief that the tomb really was empty. Second, to the belief that the disciples really had met Jesus alive again in a transformed body. How do we explain that? Lots of theories have been tried, most of them pretty thin and unconvincing. The one that fits the evidence like a glove and that is the simplest of all is that it's actually true, that Jesus really was raised from the dead. Consider the evidence. As we've seen, in the ancient world, bodily resurrection was impossible. Even for those Jews who had come to believe in it, 
resurrection was something that would only happen at the end of the world. But the early Christians actually saw an empty tomb in the here and now. And Jesus physically appeared to them. His body, they said, had been transformed. Far and away, the best explanation is that it actually happened. The early Christians saw this event as the beginning of God's new creation. That was why, very quickly, the Christian faith exploded into life right across the world. The Jewish belief in the one God and his plan for the world was transformed by belief in Jesus' resurrection into a way of life for all people. It's an astonishing thought that what we today know as Christianity, the saints and the sinners, the art and the preaching and the churches and the scholarship, it all derives from one man and what happened to him. And this way of life carries its own hope for the future, not just a life after death in the usual disembodied sense, but a real new bodily life. Jesus was crucified, he died, he was buried, it was real, it was horrible. He went to the place of the dead, however you want to describe it. But then after that, he was raised, his body was transformed. And that's what's promised to us as well. One day we too will die, and if we belong to Jesus, we will go to be with him. But our bodies will stay dead until the time when God renews the whole world and gives us new bodies like Jesus to live in it. For your goodness, we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. Jesus' we physical have... resurrection is indispensable to Christian belief. We can't simply ignore it or rationalize it away because it doesn't fit in with the modern world view. It's the fundamental bedrock of Christianity and it underlies everything that a Christian thinks or does. Without the resurrection, Christianity collapses. What's more, if Jesus' resurrection is true, then God's new creation has already begun. And that gives us the starting point, not only for thinking and hoping, but also for action. The world often seems to be ruled by the powerful, by the bullies and tyrants. Death is their ultimate weapon. But that weapon has been decisively defeated by Jesus. And because of that, a whole new world has opened up. There is life, new life, resurrection life promised to us in the future. But with Jesus' resurrection, that life has come forward into the present with all its possibilities. It can begin here and now.